Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. I'm your host, Sucheta Kamath, and we talk about executive function, our ability to manage our, our thoughts, emotions, actions, so that we can persist to pursue goals that are meaningful to us and those goals that serve our future selves. However, we are not living in uh, this world alone. We are working living with our friends, family, our communities, our nation, and uh, world, um, global world. And most important thing we are also trying to figure out is how to be part of that global world and how to contribute to it. Um, however, um, not uh, every child's experience is uh, made equal. There are a lot of factors that um, bring challenges, um, you know, and uh, when the child shows up uh, to school, uh, and look solemn, withdrawn, or irritable. Um, there can be one approach where you say, what's wrong? <laughs> hey, child, what's wrong with you? Or uh, there's a way to say, hey, what happened to you? And this shift in the way we approach and take care of our children really is fueled by thoughts about the child having a very, very meaningfully different lives at home. So, you know, I read somewhere that uh, the individual human body uh, that has been traumatized has been overwhelmed with stress, can feel helpless, reactive, angry, impulsive, uh, rageful, uh, numb, or even tending towards avoidance. And my guest says uh, that is the same case, and same is true about schools. So schools and school districts that serve the needs of children and families who have endured trauma, they too, as a a collective body can feel helpless, uh, mm. can become reactive, angry, which can lead to combative uh, encounters with each other. Uh, their decisions can be impulsively impulsive. And lastly, they too can be riddled with avoidances. So uh, we now know we have some pretty good methods in mental health and education to treat individuals as well as families uh, with that kind of backdrop of, of knowledge. And it's not just an optional thing the way I see it. It's a mandatory, very, very essential ingredient uh, to create opportunities for children to not just grow, but thrive and demonstrate resilience. So it is such a great pleasure to bring back, after begging and pleading, <laughs> my dear, dear friend, Dave Melnick, to come and give us a uh, part two of the conversation we had last time. So those listeners who are tuning in just to this episode, um, there is one more additional treat for you. So definitely check out our previous episode uh, just to get some additional um, backdrop of this conversation. But um, a little bit uh, about Dave. So Dave Melnick is a uh, LICSW. He uh, is a co-director of outpatient services at NFI Vermont, a statewide mental health agency, primary, primarily serving children, adolescents, and families. Uh, for past 35 years, he looks very young, so I don't know how he does this, but uh, he says it's 35, so we'll take it. Um, he has worked in a variety of settings, including outpatient, uh, residential treatment, and in public and day treatment schools. Uh, along with his focus on developmental trauma, Dave has expertise in family therapy, adolescence attachment, reflective practices, and trauma-informed systems. Um, one last thing I would like to kind of point out that, um, uh, you know, Dave, um, uh, he is not only a service, he takes care of children and schools, but he also trains. So he trains the trainers and uh, his um, knowledge is so deep and wide that uh, there's uh, incredible kindness and thoughtfulness, but more importantly, a, a desire and commitment to empowerment, which is what really speaks to me because I think we need a multiple days at multiple levels of educational tiers. So with that, I would like to welcome Dave to our podcast. How are you, Dave? I'm really well, Sucheta. How are you today? Excellent. And thank you Great. for coming back. And 
I just realized uh, it was very ambitious of us to cover everything that you know in one episode. Uh, but just uh, to set the tone, I thought I'll kick off this conversation with this question about uh, the two key terms that you um, laid out for us, which is trauma-informed and trauma-transformed. So can you just uh, start there? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good place to start. And 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 then I want to, in a min- moment or two, comment on what you said about the progression from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, because I want to give a, a slight minute or a half history on that and what I think is the most current evolution of that progression, which is, uh, uh, I'll state in a second, but uh, what we talked about last time in very summary fashion is is that organizations, schools, mental health agencies, child welfare offices, uh, healthcare offices um, have often three versions of responses when they, they, their staff and their client, patients, students, whatever the case may be, have been exposed to a lot of uh, stress and strain and harm. Um, and one of those, and the non-preferred that we, we touched on a little bit last time, was is, is called trauma reactive. And in those organizations, those agencies, there's actually a succumbing by the workforce and by the leaders to the same kinds of symptoms that you mentioned that are uh, often uh, present for people, individual bodies and families that have been traumatized. So everything that is true about an individual on a that's experiencing traumatic stress can also be true on an organizational level. Organizations mm. can become helpless. Organizations become can become uh, limited in their cognitive capacity. They can uh, they can be reactive. They can become angry. They cannot hear one another. They can get easily frightened uh, and risk averse. And so that's the non that's the non um, preferred version of what happens to an organization when they are around and try to heal or educate through traumatic experiences and traumatic exposures. The second in the in the uh, in the continuum, going from trauma inducing to trauma reducing, is what is you know commonly now referred to as trauma informed. And I tried to give a very quick definition of that, which really boils down to in order to be a trauma-informed person and a trauma-informed organization, you have to know the science of trauma, which is pretty substantial, although very easily understandable to anybody that works with and raises children. You have to have an understanding of the four R's that we went over, the realize, recognize, respond, and resist, uh, re-traumatization. And importantly, that being trauma-informed means that you're being responsive to the potential negative impacts that trauma can have on individual bodies and and collections of bodies like occur in classrooms and in hallways and in schools. The final version, which is both aspirational and attainable, I, I have got to believe that this is attainable even though I'm just beginning to see versions of this in different organizations around the country, is trauma transformed. And Mm. what's different about trauma transformed than trauma informed is that although it also has clinical components, it is centrally a political movement. It is about prevention. It's our work to try to make sure that we are preventing harm being perpetrated against our kids, our families, our community members, our teachers, our principals, our bus drivers, and anybody associated, really anybody in, in, in the human species. The focus is on how do we prevent that. You know, I think this, uh, your summary just reminds me of, uh, um, you know, Sandra Bloom. She's a physician who mm-hmm. uh, is a creator of the sanctuary model. And she talks about this, that trying to implement trauma-specific clinical practices without first implementing trauma-informed organizational structure, culture, culture yeah. change is like throwing seeds on dry land. Um, so you're just pointing out that, that I think it is not a child that we are taking care of. It's the systems that are taking care of children. So yes, both- and we, we talked last time about an important, like the developmental model that we use in family therapy or as family therapists is that if caregivers are reasonably good shape, if, if the people raising children are reasonably well, that gives the child the best chances of being well. And just basic kind of trickle mm. down that, that, you know, when, when primary caregivers are doing well, they have lots and lots of things to offer kids, the things that kids need to, in order to thrive and, and heal when, when, when necessary. I'm glad, Sucheta, that you brought up Dr. Bloom, um, because that connects so beautifully from what you said before. She is um, long credited with the expression, that progression of what's wrong with you to what happened to you. And that, um, her belief is that many of us in the clinical world, and myself included, were trained in models that focused to some degree 
on pathology and deficit in that the um, central approach, one of the central approaches for me as, as a social worker and in Dr. Bloom's work is to focus much more on asset and strength and ability. So the progression now is much more representative as, as let's move from what's wrong with you to what happened to you, to what is it about you that enabled you to survive the way that you survived that wow. adversity. So it's much more uh, directed around asset-based and strength-based um, because I often talk with kids and families, uh, certainly about the, the things perpetrated against them, but I'm more interested in the elements the personal elements, the cultural elements, the familial elements, the, the, the community elements that actually promoted healing. And in many cases, natural healing that does not necessarily have to be outsourced to a, a mental health provider or a teacher or a speech and language therapist or an occupational therapist. There's a lots, of, lots of healing that goes on and has gone on spontaneously and organically that we have not done a good job um, professionally recognizing. No, thank you for making that uh, connection back. Um, and as uh, uh, we proceed to the next uh, deeper dive uh, about the process and uh, and the methods, I just wanted to um, see if am I getting it correctly. So when we talk about uh, one of the things um, which you answered my question, which was going to be, do we even understand the term trauma? Uh, people who are trying to take care of it, do they understand what it is? So is um, is it because there is, or have we come to conclusion that there is a universal definition of trauma and are there, you know, there are examples of trauma, but it's not limited to, which is experiencing or observing physical, uh, sexual or emotional abuse, it, uh, which could be a childhood neglect. There could be uh, having family members uh, with mental health and substance abuse disorders. So a lot of instability in the members uh, who a family who take care of the children, experiencing or witnessing violence in the community, um, and also poverty and systemic yes. uh, discrimination. So yeah. are these good, um, is this a good list to begin with when we think about trauma? I think those are the list of things that are potentially traumatizing events or immersive and relentless experiences. Uh, so I think what's there's much more agreement on the conditions that might lead to trauma, and there's much less consensus about what trauma actually is in terms of describing what trauma oh. is. I think what I was trying to clarify the last time that we talked is that as a clinical concern, trauma largely is something that is distinguished by something that overwhelms your ability to cope and has potential long-term effect on your biological, emotional thinking and action systems, that beta and that beta um acronym that I used last time. Yes. So to me, the two things that are important about trauma as a, as a condition, as a potential impact area is um, if, if the experience overwhelms your ability to cope, not all abusive situations overwhelm, not all, um, you, you know, physical assaults overwhelm a person's ability to cope, that it is both the, uh, inability to cope and the longer lasting effect that I think distinguishes what really what trauma is as a clinical concern, as a parenting concern, as an educational concern. Great. So with that now, uh, maybe you can talk to us about the key practices that you recommend us to use to help foster growth and healing. Okay. So that's great. So there's two premises that I think are important to, to cover before I go into the, the more fundamental question that you're asking. One premise is that I, I don't believe that everybody um, through this pandemic, that not everybody has been harmed or that not everybody is unwell and that not, and not everybody has been injured by the pandemic in the last two and a half years. We know, you and I know, that whenever there's a community crisis, it's always disproportionate in its impact and it tends to always harm people on the margins. The effect that I've experienced from the pandemic is so much less than people that don't have the resources and the advantages and the privileges that, that, that I have. And so I think that's an important premise that lots of people today and even pre-pandemic have been unwell, injured, harmed by the list of things that you said before, by abuse, neglect, deprivation, domestic violence, parental substance addictions, uh, racism, sexism, classism, transphobia, homophobia, uh, uh, ableism, all those things are harmful and potentially harmful conditions. 
but I do take it as a part of the premise of our conversation that many people right now are unwell and that many people have been harmed and hurt and impacted and injured and wounded by the last two and a half years. That is particularly true of anybody that works in schools and attends schools. So I think you're hard pressed to find mm. people that uh, have been completely unscathed. So that's the first premise um, that I'm, I'm operating under today. And, and until yes. we fully heal from, from, from this pandemic and other ills and harms in our communities. The second premise is a, a formula that I use almost routine. Oh, yes, absolutely routinely. Anytime I talk to groups of educators, parents, mental health professionals, child welfare workers, anybody that has a love and professional um, uh, uh, interest in children, I'm going to talk about this formula. And the formula, and I'll ask people that have the capacity to write it down as I narrate it, is uh, it, it looks like a math formula, uh, but I'm going to turn it to, into more of a psychological um, formula. And what it looks like is if if you're willing to draw it, as I say it, um, think about a math formula that has a circle plus a circle plus a circle equaling a square. So circle plus circle plus circle equals square. If you write it lot large enough, if you're listening and are able to write it down, then write it large enough because I'll ask you to draw, uh, to write some words in each one of these and to, to almost do like a mini diagram about this. In the first, uh, in the first uh, circle, if you'd put uh, student behavior or student conduct or student actions, and then in the square, so right at the end, I'm, I'm sorry, there should be an equal sign. So circle plus circle plus circle, equals square. In the square, if you would write in the square, outcomes, student outcomes, consequences. So the first circle is student behavior. The last square on the other side of the equal sign is outcomes. What a traditional belief system is about children is that what children do, what children do in a classroom, in the hallway, in the ball field, that there's a direct line almost. So if you drew almost a, a line and forgot those other circles, drew a, like a curved line from that first circle to the square, that's the way many people that work with schools and raise children believe about kids. A kid uh, back talks, the consequence is you get sent out of a class. The kid puts their head down on the desk, they get a zero on their assignment. What's problematic about that linear cause and effect model is it completely discounts two other highly relevant factors that are impactful on the overall outcome of uh, and consequences, really the outcome of a child's behavior. So in the first circle, what a child does, I believe that children, regardless of what's happened to them, have some accountability for their behavior. That the only way I can imagine to run a civil society is to hold people accountable even when you've been harmed. The way that we hold people that have been traumatized accountable though is gonna be different than the way you would hold a typically developed child that mm. doesn't have the adverse exposures that many of the students that I work with, most of the students that I work with have. Is that making sense so far? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. In and and okay. I'm, I can't wait for the other circles if I may just interject. Please. But I think it's such a colloquial wisdom uh, it is that um, people come uh, or their bodies and minds show up in the classrooms to learn and they're supposed to learn no matter what the barriers they have encountered. Yeah. And it's almost the uh, the position is, and, and it's just a cultural change, I feel, you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's <laughs> the last hundred years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the right because word. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I remember even like simple thing, uh, you know, my, my mother who uh, lives with me and she just turned 80 and it's a funny conversation about uh, with her about her schooling experience. And, you know, a standard practice was a teacher would have a stick. And if you even like no eraser was given to a child <laughs> because eraser means bad <laughs> mm -hmm. and you just got beatings like like that was literally like, yeah, as you mentioned, student, uh, you know, outcomes, you know, or, or actions and outcomes were think, thought to be as a straight line. Linear. So yeah. bad outcome is your bad. <laughs> Good how outcome. Does your, how does your uh -huh. mom talk about that experience? Like what, what, what's the flavor of the, t or the tone of how she reflects on that? 
Um, it is very interesting, and um, if I may indulge in, in like two experiences, but um, I think, um, and it's also a very, very mixed feeling because you come from India where guru or teacher is considered um, the top of the top. You, the teacher is close to God. And, and so teaching or being in the company of a teacher is considered a, a cultural privilege. And so there's a wonderful way you relate to education. There's a lot of respect. But also the teacher's intolerance or your uh, infractions is considered um, your disrespect towards not just the teacher, but the teaching process. Mm -hmm. And so that disrespect needs to be brought online by punishment, you know? So there's a very concrete way of thinking. So she, as she has a, she, as she relates, one is she feels she must have some done something. It was her mistake, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how she processed it and internalized. It was never the teacher lacks patience or the teacher actually is unkind, was never in the picture. Mm -hmm. And second thing is also, um, uh, I I, I was telling my mother this recently, like her resilience, you know, she was left-handed and it was beaten out of her mm -hmm. and she became right-handed and she continues to sew with left hand. She, um, she's ambidextrous and she never looked, looks at it as being gifted. Mm. You know what I mean? So that yeah, there's a yeah. lost opportunity to me that a child who has become an adult has gone through these amazing adjustments and skills how many people are ambidextrous, right? Yeah. That she has never, never given herself any credit. So yeah. that that's the kind of a byproduct. I don't know yeah. if you were thinking about that or not. Yeah, yeah, but I think it sounds like what you described is minimally some ambivalence about it. On the one hand, it, yes. it hardened and toughened her and allowed her to develop these resilience and these new capacities. On the other hand, uh, what what got lost in the suppression of uh, her own ideas, her own style of wanting to do something, the message that she was bad, um, perhaps for not following exactly what was expected of her. So it sounds like she can represent um, both possibilities or both experiences. That, and I'll say that's true about me too. I mean, I don't know if I qualify for, uh, you know, childhood trauma experiences, but my traumas were all about... Um, my ideas were never respect worthy. Yeah. They were always disruptive and they were creating a disruption in the flow of how things were supposed to unfold. So questioning was taken as uh, you being actually, you know, your actions are disruptive. And so it's just a, you know, and I don't know about girls and boys distinction here, but I internalize that as something is wrong with me. Why do I want to challenge anything? Why can't I just go along with things? Yeah. And, and Sucheta, that, that to me is such a fundamental experience of people that are harmed in all different kinds of way, whether you name it trauma or you may name it adversity, that one of the designs of small children is they are um, oriented towards self-blame then they are yes. blaming the person that might be perpetrating harm on them. The capacity to externalize the blame happens much later in development. Um, yeah. but young children carry around the, the 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 artifacts of feeling like there's something wrong with them or else their parent wouldn't be hurting them or their teacher wouldn't be humiliating them, making yes. sense of it cognitively and placing responsibility where it really should be happens later on for children, oftentimes after a fair amount of collateral damage has occurred for that for that child. And you know, maybe you can make a quick comment here. Why are we using these motiv motivational mechanisms? You know, humiliation seems to be uh, like a belief. If I pick on you, you will straighten out. So because you would not like to be picked on, yeah. you know, but if I say it, say it to you kindly, you might take advantage of my kindness and never improve. You know, there's that some perverse way of thinking that reprimanding leads to more tight self-control or self-regulation. Do you have any thoughts about that? Why we go with that wisdom versus what actually works? Yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, and we talked very briefly, at least we mentioned the book, My Grandmother's Hands. And I think yes. there is as good a tracing of the history uh, in this country, in the United States, of who came here and what they were carrying with them, the, the, some of the uh, child rearing practices, that although the people that came here might have been rebelling against certain conditions from where they came, um, but they came also with a with a fair fairly high level of of kind of unrecognized pedagogy when it comes to child rearing mm. practices, and that here we are hundreds of years uh, 
you know, as the white settlers, the people that colonized, um, and still not completely having done our work on separating from our uh, our roots and how we even look at children, you know, how children are still viewed and the things that we can rationalize in doing to children because there's still at least a notion that they uh, are not individuated humans, that they are they are uh, to be under the command of adults. And so the more that we command children, the more that we will raise children that will then command their children, that we know mm. that there's an intergenerationality in parenting styles and that it often takes somebody disruptive or rebellious to say, I'm not sure this is going to work. This is working for me and that I'm going to carry this forward in the next generation. So the, the, in, the, in terms of this formula, one of the things that I really push back on is that I'm not saying that there aren't antecedents to kids' behavior, and I'm not saying that kids are not ultimately accountable for certain things. But what I am saying that is that in the second circle, so in the first circle, we have child behavior. In the second circle, we have adult response. And my claim is that how adults respond to child's behavior, so how the adult in circle two responds to what a child does is as relevant, is as vital, mm. And it's as important, if not more so, than what the kid did. So my belief, my observation, and I think there's plenty of data to support this, that how an adult responds to what a kid does is as critical as what the kid did, did including a kid back-talking you, threatening another kid, kicking a hole in the wall, that how we respond has as much to do with the outcome as what the child did. And that's often not the way that many people see the world. In fact, when I say that without further explanation, there's hands that get raised very quickly saying, well, are you blaming me for what the child does? And in my head, what I say is, of course, I'm not blaming you, but of course, I'm holding you co-responsible that you are a co-author. You co-construct the outcomes, whether you're a mom or dad, an auntie or uncle, a school teacher, a principal, a coach, the way that you respond, particularly to problematic behavior absolutely has an impact on the outcome. And mm. I think that that is incredibly provable, what I'm saying. And I think the proof, proof is rather simple. Follow a middle school kid around. Follow a kid that you watch in first period class that is defiant to their teacher, but that teacher happens to be trauma-informed and has a good relationship with that kid. And watch how artfully and gracefully that human being handles defiant behavior to the point where the outcomes are, end up being pretty good because of the talent level and the experience level of that workforce member. Follow that kid to the second period class where the teacher's not trauma-informed. Same behavior emerges. The kid becomes defined. I'm not doing this. This is stupid. You can't make me. And the teacher matches the intensity of the kid and says, if you raise your voice, if you don't, and begins to threaten, humiliate, raise their voice to the point where the kids, you know, at co-escalates with the teacher. And then all of a sudden you have a kid getting bounced out of class, not because of the defiance singularly, but because of the combination of the defiance and the response of the adult. But one of the things that is wow. most problematic in families and in schools and in therapy is that we spend a lot of time in schools, and I'll say this with some irony, irony in my voice, Sucheta, but I mean it seriously, is I think we spend too much time in schools talking about kids in curriculum. I think when we spend all of the available adult time, adult to adult time in schools, spending time just talking primarily about kids in curriculum, we lose any possibility of speaking about this second circle, how our response mm. system directly impacts. And I think it's an equity issue. And I think it's an equity issue because if we spend all this time in schools when we just have adult time together, and all that time is distributed to surveilling and deconstructing and analyzing children, then we are saying that children are the problem. And the equity yeah. issue is that the equity issue becomes then we are taking no responsibility or little responsibility for our own ethnicity, our own race, our own culture, our own bias, our own beliefs, our own pedagogy, our own conditioning and socialization as a kid and saying that's not relevant here at all. And I think that's hugely problematic. Wow. And, you know, it's uh, from the uh, executive function lens, you know, I, I feel 
uh, we talk a lot about that put your mask on first before you help people. But I feel uh, um, you polish your mirror first before you yes. offer other person to look in uh, to a mirror that yeah. is not polished, yes. you know? Yes. So I think that lack of self-awareness to me is a profound gap because you are certifying yourself to be fully competent in your ability to res respond with patience, kindness, or a reflective stance. And also, I think, are you taking perspective um, on that child from a child's perspective? That is such an essential ingredient. Yeah, yeah I think that's critical what you said, and it'll, we'll circle back to in a little while about the capacity. I think we have so many different lenses by which we look at children that are good. We, we have theories and science and experience, like we have all these lenses and that's great. But I think what you just said that the most important tool to me to work with and raise children is a mirror and not a lens. And that we need yeah. not only the mirrors that we hold up to ourselves because those are limited. You can't see the back of your head. You need a friend or somebody to help you see the things that you don't see in yourself. And so for that, in order to really optimize our capacity as adults working with and raising children is we need people that will, will reveal to us the things that we don't see about ourselves, because that's where dangerous things happen between adults and children is when adults are acting in an unexamined way, where they're not examining oh. their own experience, their own triggers. I'm all for talking to kids about their triggers and antecedents. And here where I think is where, <laughs> where, the, where the real equity issue is, I think it's patently unfair that we ask five, seven, nine, 14, 16 year old kids incredibly rigorous questions about what they just did with, with functional behavioral analysis and ABAs and all. We ask kids incredibly rigorous questions about themselves, which I'm fine with, provided the adults are doing the same. Yeah, and zero self-reflection. Zero. Yeah. And so often when I start asking questions, it's amazing how vulnerable and fragile adults are when I ask very basic questions about their conduct and their behavior and their antecedents and their triggers. Because those things, if we're going to ask kids that, we owe it to children, particularly children that have been traumatized. We owe it to them that we're doing as rigorous self-examination as we're asking them to do it. And if we're not, that's an inequitable system and we're actually harming kids. And can I probe this right here? Something wonderful you said. It comes back to this foundational understanding of when people get together under the under a roof of school, schooling. There is this inherent belief that I teach, you learn. So somehow there has to be some sort of submission. Yes. There has to be, I, I am, I don't want to say I'm the king, but I ha have knowledge and I have a way to impart the knowledge and you need to become a vessel. Um, and that vessel, if it's empty, only then I can fill. Yeah. So there is a little bit of a assumption that it's not equal. Yeah. Teaching and learning are not equal, um, is not done on an equal footing. Yeah. And I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you, maybe we are getting that wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think the most progressive, disruptive, innovative, and excellent teachers are the ones that truly don't just give lip service to the idea that they are learners as much as they are teachers. But I do think that mm. that's absolutely where we're heading in lots and lots of places. Where when I walk into classrooms and I see the level of creativity, when I see teachers circling up with kids and truly working the spirit of, I have as much to learn here. And if I listen very carefully to kids, I'll become a better instructor. If I'm, if I'm a better listener and a better learner, and if I keep myself kind of present in the learning experience, I can't but become a better teacher. So it, so it, amazing. It, Very powerful. And, and, and in this formula, so we got a third circle we got to get to in a second, but I, I linger on this second circle and I make a very a strong appeal as I can that um, teachers that are highly reactive to child behavior um, always struggle with child behavior. When you're, when you are as reactive as the kid is impulsive, that's a problem. The only time that an adult human being has to respond quickly to a child is if there's imminent aggression. In every other circumstances that I can think of, deliberation, intentionality, exhaling, mindfulness will always breed better outcomes. 
And so again, I think it's ironic that sometimes I consult with teachers and in my head, I'm thinking, wow, you're as impulsive as the impulsive kid. That's a problem. Like you, you can't, you can't join the kids rapid pace with your response unless again, there's somebody that's about to be harmed. And in fact, the teachers that I watch that are exuding excellence, they're the ones that when there is a behavioral concern in the classroom, they take a fair amount of time to address it. And that what's communicated to the other kids is confidence. Because one of the things that mm. you communicate to children very quickly by responding impulsively, what, one of the things that you communicate to children is that you are anxious and that you are not in charge. The faster you respond to certain kinds of behaviors, the more likely you're communicating to the kids, oh, we can get to Mr. Melnick. Look, we got him all wound up. He's struggling. He's, he's, off, he's off balance here. And not that, you know, the kids are going to be intentionally predatory, but they're looking to feel safe. And if I'm highly reactive, that doesn't feel safe to kids. And so the work of trauma transformation is fundamentally a top-down notion. We've got to get the workforce in a much more relaxed, less reactive and a reflective place where they understand that part of this outcome formula rests firmly on their shoulders. Because the final thing I'll say about this second circle, adult response, is I've been a, a child therapist for 35, 38 years. It's really hard to change people, other people. The most effective way to change a child, whether it's your own child or it's your student, is to change yourself. It is much more efficient. It's much more effective. And it's much more likely to have outcomes. The teachers that I work with that become trauma-informed and successful are the ones that are, again, Sujeta, holding the multiple mirrors up. And they're developing methods amongst their colleagues where they're talking more about themselves and what's coming up for them, working with kids that have challenges, mm. than they are poking constantly during their department meetings around how do we work with this kid? How do we fix? The most inefficient thing to do is to try to talk about 10 kids in a 45 minute block that you're worried about. The most effective thing <laughs> is to talk about one kid and your response to that kid and how you can shape and control and change and adapt how you're working with that kid. And then the, the third circle um, that impacts outcome is of course context. And context includes everything that would come to mind from anybody listening right now. Context would include where's the behavior happening? When's it happening? Is it in the classroom? Is it in the hallway? Is it at bedtime? Is it in the middle of the day? You know, if you're if you're a, a parent, that context includes what's the nature of your relationship with that kid, because the better the relationship you have, the more contextual issues and the more rights I have to try certain things with kids if I have a really good relationship. But context also includes, I am you know people most people listening won't be able to see me. I'm a, a white straight cisgendered middle age middle age middle class man. I'm six foot two tall, and that if I don't carry and I said this a little bit last time, if I don't carry that knowledge into every interaction that I have with people, that's a problem. That's a contextual issue. That for many of the youth that I work with, kids that are uh, in the BIPOC community, kids that are in the queer community, that. I automatically represent something that's harmful for them. And if I don't contextually understand that, then I am creating conditions under which I am contributing to their harm. Wow. So many thoughts are circling in my head as I think about your third circle, um, you know, context. I think um, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about, so there is, uh, the context in terms of the cultural context, you know, what's your relationship uh, to the group? You know, you may be a minority teacher in a majority group versus vice versa. It could be time of the day. You know, I had uh, Daniel Pink talking about his book, When, which is our biochemistry is different during different parts of the day where, you know, a child who's hungry, uh, who may be hangry, Absolutely. you know, and, and that could be a simple reason that child is misbehaving. I you could Absolutely. be hungry. If you have a, if you have a <laughs> third angry. grade student that you have for most of the day, and that kid is a is learning reasonably optimally eleven o'clock at eleven o'clock in the morning, and then by one o'clock in the afternoon, the kid is surly, defiant, mouthy. It could be about blood sugar. It could be about tiredness. It could be about what I really focus on. What happened on the playground? 
Because when yes. I hear a teacher say, it's the same kid, well, Dave, why was he learning at 11 and why not at one? I say, he's not the same kid. Because if the stress level changed, if the kid was bullied or harmed or hurt or saw a sibling and was reminded of something that happened at home the night before, then it's not the same kid. It's a different version of the same kid. And that we have to recognize that there might have been something in the child's stress experience that now has them leading, leading so, so they're presenting in a very different way in the classroom. You know, I mean, I think uh, this reminds me of like a, a, you know, I think um, what kind of person you are, you know, person who has done the self-work, a person who is mature, person who has experienced something called motivational maturation. That means your motivations are not to control and and squish everything, but just allow things to thrive. Uh, I like to think about uh, a visual when I talk to educators is uh, you, you can be you're a tree under which children are seeking shade. So you can decide what kind of tree it is because if it's too shady, then nothing grows under shade, Yes. right? And if it's too tall and thin and has no leaves, then there's no shade, you know? So just the right amount of shade. How do you decide that? That means how do you make children feel that they are safe with you, but they also are ready to take academic and interpersonal right. so risks, in, which is what learning is all world, about. In your expertise around executive functioning, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I don't know for sure. Is it fair for me to assume as a non-expert in executive functioning that relationships enhance executive functioning amongst kids? If I have a good relationship and I'm the second grade teacher, I might get better executive functioning functioning from a kid that I have a really good relationship with, or does it not work that way? Oh, absolutely. Primarily because we tend to self-regulate um, if there is a social presence. That means we are likely to regulate. Uh, this is a gross example, but it is like uh, you when you the things you will do in an elevator when you're yes. by yourself. Versus a one person enters the elevator and you suddenly yeah. shape up. Yes. That's yes. <laughs> social yes. regulation. And that's what executive function allows you to do. Nudges you to regulate yourself because your behavior, actions, and your expression of thoughts and emotions influences yeah. other people. And that awareness makes yeah. you better. <laughs> so in terms of uh, the, the um, that's just a formula. And again, it's a second premise. One premise is there's lots of unwell people. Second premise is, I part of my job is I've got to convince people that um, this formula is the most relevant way to understand outcomes and that we can't continue to shoulder kids by filling out behavior plans and 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 various different plans that exist in schools because I think it says to the kids exactly opposite of what you said before I think absent some really careful and considerate planning I think many kids fill out behavior plans and the interpretation they make is there's something wrong with me because look who fills out behavior plans mm. in this classroom. The, the kids, you know, the kids know who the behavior plan kids are. So there's an automatic potential negative yeah. feedback loop on that. Uh, so Dave, how do we um, manage all this? What are, I know you have a very thoughtful way uh, that you recommend uh, us to approach uh, this process. So how should we go about it? Yeah, so going back to the premise of unwellness, injury, harm, wounding through through trauma and how that wounds bodies and collective bodies and communities and organizations and schools and things like that, that we we use a metaphor um, and with some level of detail that I'll, I'll just I'll just touch on just so people can leave with a, a sense around that. And the metaphor is that in order to address when unwellness and, and illness and injury and wounding has become big enough, sometimes we need medicine to take care of that. And so the metaphor is that in order to heal organizations um, that have been harmed by, uh, by trauma, um, that we think about uh, medicine and a delivery system, that medicine without a delivery system. So if you think about having medicine, but no way of getting it into the people's mm. you know, mouths and arms, then the medicine doesn't do any good. So I'll just name what the five ingredient components of the medicine are that we use. And, and they can be different, different organizations, different people would say, my medicine's different. You know, the, the components of what we use to heal, help heal people is different. That's fine. And then the six step delivery system is like, how do you, it's, it's from implementation sciences. How do you implement, how do you get this, these good medicines into the people that need them? So the five ingredients for us. Uh, and they change even from when you and I met a couple of years ago. I've changed one of them. The first one, and and Sujeta, you 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 tell me if I want if if there's any detail. I'll just name them, and then if you want some detail on them. 
Yeah, so that first, sounds great. A little bit of detail or just name them? Uh, well, I think a little bit of detail will also help. Okay. So um, the first medicine, the first uh, ingredient in the medicine is, is uh, that we believe that everybody needs to, everybody that works with and raises children needs to have an understanding of stress. And so we go into a so fair powerful. amount of detail of understanding, uh, and we use this progression of terms around stress that it's about detection, connection, and mitigation. And what that means is that in order to be effective in moderating stress, and in this case, post-traumatic stress that can impact an individual person or collective of people, that in order to, to get to mitigation, you've got to detect it first. You've got to know how it's impacting you. And so we spend a lot of time in our work teaching people, adults, to get really good at detecting different stress states in their own bodies and being able to, in a very granular level, know the difference between stress states that are helpful and stress states that are harmful. One of the um, uh, notions that many people carry, popular notions, is that stress is bad. And that's not the case. Stress is inherently nev neither good nor bad. It depends. Hmm. The, whether stress is positive and productive or negative and harmful depends on the amount of stress, the frequency of stress, the type of stress, the age or developmental stage you are at. Hmm. Uh, it depends on the escapability of the stress. When you can't escape the stress, that is more harmful than stress that you can get away from. So those factors uh, and the overall capacity to be able to detect where you are on the stress continuum, which is what we teach. We, we show these beautiful slides around the stress continuum and the stress curve. The second notion is around connection. And that notion is that um, if you work with and raise children, um, it is highly likely that the stress that you are experiencing and the stress that you are enduring will not get erased by self-care, that there is not enough self-care time in your life to be able to completely mitigate. One of the things that we push back on in our world of stress is that stress should be community property. It should not be, um, it should not be individualized and privatized the way it is in our culture, that stress is your problem. We don't believe that in trauma transformation. We believe that your stress, Sucheta, if you and I were working together in a school, your stress would be certainly some of your responsibility to mitigate, but it would also be my responsibility that your stress, like my stress, is community property. It is a team sport to address it and not an individual endeavor alone. So I really like that, by the way, uh, yeah. Dave. I think it's such a profound way. It's like a universal hug. You know, yeah. putting arms around every individual in the community so they're never alone. I really think it's it'll change our world if we do that. I think if we really saw stress as community property and stopped individualizing and patho pathologizing, there is not a diagnosis in DSM 5R that is not impacted and precipitated by stress. There is not 100%, one that you could, right, hundred percent, right. That that you could have conditions that you know genetic that you were born with that are going to be made worse if you're in heightened levels of stress. So we talk about again detecting it, connecting with one another, and having methods and means and measures by which every family, every workforce, every work group, every classroom has means by which they are connecting with one another, so we can then accomplish the third step, which was around mitigation, the kinds of stress that's that's most harmful. One of the things, and then I'll move on to the next one because I could talk for hours about stress. One of the things that we find incredibly important, uh, particularly when you work with educators, is that there is often a, um, an unwritten rule um, that you suppress negative stress if you're an educator, that you mm. inhibit it, you suppress it, it's your problem, check it at the door, don't let it out. And one of the things that we know, both by the ACEs study, but we knew it before that, we know that when you suppress negative stress states, it does not metabolize in your body. It metastasizes. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we know that stress will reveal itself either with your permission or without your permission. So powerful. And, and so stress can reveal itself with your permission when you exercise, when you meditate, when you do yoga when you break bread with friends, when you talk about and download your day with your partner, that's letting stress out with your permission. When we overly suppress it, it will come out without our permission if we don't have methods by which we 
mitigate it. And we all know the ways that stress comes out without our permission. We humiliate other people. We lose our temper. We're impatient. We're harmful. We're mean. We're unkind. We're short-tempered, all those kinds of things. So lots more we could talk about at some point, maybe about stress. The second um, key ingredient uh, you already named earlier, uh, Sucheta, was is reflective practice. That we believe that you certainly have to read books about kids and you have to understand executive functioning and learning style and personality theory and mood and all those. Like there's lots of lenses by which to understand the landscape and the landscape being kids and families and, and what we can see out there. But reflective practices, as we talked about earlier today, I believe it's far more important and far more relevant to outcomes, whether they're educational outcomes or their mental health outcomes or well-being outcomes, that we have methods and means and measures by which our workforce can reflect together in groups no larger than six people on a regular basis, mm -hmm. that we spend time analyzing, deconstructing, surveilling, and understanding ourselves, our own antecedents and triggers and conditions, conditioning and socialization. And to the best of our ability, make sure that we are examining those factors so we can have the most control over outcomes with kids when we're most clear about who we are and why we do what we do, not who the kid is and why they do what they do. There are too many kids with too many complicated presentations to be experts in all the kinds of kids. Yes, so such a good point. Yes. So yeah, reflective practices, be an expert on you. If you're an expert yes. on you, you will automatically um, learn what you need to learn about people that you, you don't know or you don't understand. And I, if I can just interject here, one of the challenges to this reflective practices is you need strong executive function to be able to reflect. Yeah. And so one of the challenges that I talk in my circles that we want children to take responsibility for their own learning when we don't take responsibility for our own teaching. Yes. yes. And your self lack of self-awareness uh, can be very harmful to children because your assumption is I teach so you learn. But yes. what if you fail to teach the way student learns yeah. you, and you never reflect on it? then it never becomes part of your self-corrective process. Well, it's critical. I, I may have said this last time, but it bears reiterating that there is no such thing as self-awareness without information from other people. There's just so yes. much you can know about yourself um, that, that other people know you differently than you know yourself. That doesn't mean they know you better. They know you differently. And the information that other people have about us often can be incredibly important in uh, our own capacity to improve our, our our quality of teaching, counseling, parenting, whatever it is that that we do. So that reflective practice, um, and and often what ends up happening in schools is, you know, the concern around we don't have time for that. It is much more, and there's research to back up what I'm about to say. There is much more effective learning that happens in an hour a month of reflecting with your colleagues on on your beliefs, your assumptions, your relationship with kids than there is in a six hours of professional development where somebody like me comes and speaks at people. That there is a robust amount of knowledge and, and research that says reflective practice enhances the learning of our workforce far more effectively and efficiently than standard professional development. The third ingredient, and I'll just run through these other ones. The third ingredient is the capacity to reframe and what reframing, everybody knows what reframing is conceptually. How it's used here is that oftentimes people get a fixed notion of behaviors, particularly problematic behaviors, and they often put a singular label on what is really a very complex um, set of conditions and behaviors that the kid might be expressing. So reframing is the capacity to have multiple explanations for what appears to be a singular behavior. And it rests, oh, wow. it yeah. rests on the notion, reframing rests on the notion, one of the notions that what you see, you see selectively. Because you and I, Sucheta, could be watching the same news program, and we could both have different labels on what we're watching. And so we know that, that what we see is, is a construction, a social construction based on your own, your gender, your sexual orientation, your conditioning, your your race, you know, your socioeconomic status, that what you see literally is impacted by who you are. There, there, is, yeah. there is certainly objective truths, but more truths are subjective. And so reframing mm. is 
living with the reality, living in the both and world, I can comfortably work with a child and say they are both defiant and incredibly self-protective and tenacious. I can live in both worlds. And in fact, mm -hmm. I am more effective in working with defiant kids because I recognize that the minute you label something, you limit it. The minute you put a label on something, you limit it. Now, li limit labels are great. I mean, we we professionally, you and I, we need limits. We need labels because it's there's an efficiency. You say somebody has an executive functioning challenge to me, and you can say three words, and and I got some ideas about what you're saying. But we have to look at the flip side of of labeling, which is the moment you label it, you limit it, and you potentially kill curiosity and wondering what else could this be. And your own exploration about what other things may be mitigating or influencing. Yes. Because that label has so much such strong boundaries. Right. Exactly. And that's where the limiting comes in. And so an example of reframing I gave is that the most trauma-informed human beings are the one that can be working with a child and living in the both and world, a child that's being very defiant. No, I'm not doing this. You can't make me, Mr. Malik. I hate you. Um, you're not so-and-so. You can't make me do anything. So when kids get their back up against the wall, they're defiant, they're avoidant, they're putting their heads down on the desk, they're refusing to do tasks. I have great success with those kids, as many of the teachers uh, do that I work with, because they're really good at seeing the both and. What else is this child doing be besides being defiant? Because I would argue that what they're also doing is they're being determined. They're being self-protective. Mm -hmm. They're being passionate about their own beliefs. They're setting a limit on me because I'm probably asking them to do something that is evoking a feeling that they don't like. You know, it's a, um, I, I know you're on a roll here. I just quickly reminded me of a story I read this uh, past weekend uh, by, um, I think, Sam Anderson in New York Times. And it was about, uh, it, I think it, the story was called, I Have Always Struggled With My Weight. Losing it didn't mean winning. And the story is literally about this reframing that he goes through, um, he has struggled with his weight and he goes through his um, visit, his father who passes away and his t-shirts, he looks at them, how, who has, who was a runner. And, and then he looks at his own relationship to food and he says, um, and, and at the end, he just concludes that, you know, I, I, I'm not overeating. I'm curious and I explore the yeah. world uh, through food in yes. addition to, I was just such a wonderfully written yeah. article. Yes. You know what I mean? So I think we need that, those kinds of little nudges so that we can heal from our own obsessive or erroneous or not so such good methods or whatever we want to call it. But we need that reframing process. Um, you said to me, process. you said one of the crucial things about reframing and why it works as a mindset and as a strategy. And that is that, if you look at a child and you call them defiant, that shapes the interaction. It shapes your tone, your emotion as the adult, your, your affect yes. tone, what the kid can read from you. And when you reframe it, um, what you're actually doing is you're communicating in a different affect state with the kid because yes. most of us don't feel the same about a determined kid or a self-protected kid as we do about a defiant kid. And so when we change yes. the language, it's not just some clever language shift. It is intended to change our experience of that behavior. When we change our experience and our perception of it, the child will feel it. It will feel like we're collaborative instead of critical towards them. The fourth, and I know we're running shy. So, Good. so the, the yes, yes, we are running. Maybe we can cover these five, and that'll be great okay. uh, for today. But yes, tell us about the, the number four and so five. The, the fourth ingredient is relationality. Relational. I use the word relationality because it's an underused word. People use relationship. I really want to get people's attention when I say relationality because it's really about the art and science of how we develop relationships with people. That we know, I love that term. And we and we and we know from our own life experience, and we also know from the research and literature, that the singular most important tool in affecting change with another human being is a relationship. We're not. Yes. I'm not an engineer. I don't have a lot of fancy tools to do my work. The primary tool that all of us use when we're effective is the ability to, to, to form and maintain and sustain a relationship with somebody, particularly somebody that has been harmed and hurt in relationships. It's hard to develop a relationship 
with somebody that has prior experiences that relationship represent harm and hurt and, and abuse and all those kinds of things. So relationality is, uh, and I will partially quote Maya Angelou because I think it's particularly pertinent to this ingredient in the medicine of transforming trauma. Um, longer quote, but, but essentially Maya Angelou talks about that people will forget what you say and did, but they won't forget how you made them feel. When I'm in, interacting with mm. a kid and that child is struggling, they may not remember a word about what I'm saying, but they will remember what it felt like to be with me. Did it feel honoring and kind? Did it feel humiliating? Did it feel like I was trying to use my power to outmaneuver or to, to harm them? They may not remember a, a moment of what I said, but they will remember the, 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 the body tone feel, uh, and that's critical. And so part of what we talk about in this fourth ingredient is how do, how do we maximize our capacity to develop relationships, recognizing that many of the kids that we're most worried about are experiencing relational poverty. And what they need most oh. is, is enhancement, is they need two or three trustworthy, reliable relationships as a precondition to learning. Relationships for all kids Love that. is a precondition for learning. Most kids arrive at school with those relationships intact. So they don't necessarily need them with their teacher. They, they benefit from them. And then the fifth area um, is, uh, is co-care, community care. And so as an ingredient to transform trauma, what co-care is, many people have heard the term, it is the more important older sibling of self-care. And so I, <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of self-care. I think self-care is a necessary component to human well-being. It is not sufficient. There is not enough time mm. in the day. There is not enough um, access to take care of yourself for you to be a completely well human being. In fact, that's not how evolution has taught us that we have survived all these hundreds of thousands of years. We've survived as a species primarily because we're really good at caring for one another, not because we take yeah. bubble baths or because we go on a jog. Those are important. I don't mean to put those down, but what co-care is, <laughs> yes. is that it is the responsibility of the community, a school, a mental health agency, a classroom to figure out together, how are we going to take care of one another? Co-care is about how do we take care of one another? So self-care necessary, but not sufficient community care. And so one, one last thing I'll say about many people that are listening probably work for organizations that promote self-care and they meet, they even have mm -hmm. apps and, 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 and contests of who gets the most steps and that stuff's fine. Except when organizations promote self-care in the absence of, of, of providing co-care, what the organization is doing for their workforce then self-care self becomes weaponized. And it becomes weaponized in this form of, if you're not well, employee, it's because you're not doing enough self-care. You're not taking good care of yourself. And it's a bit patronizing. So self-care, when, when it is promoted singularly by a, work, by, a, by a workplace without also saying, hey, workforce, this is how we're taking care of you. Without that second more important component, then we often have a implicit way that we're blaming people when they're not well yeah. at work. You know, I think as I'm listening um, to you, it's just, I, I don't, not, I'm not coming from a place of discouragement, but I just, I'm thinking there's so many opportunities for people to change the way we educate care yeah. providers, educate yes. and prepare our teachers educate and prepare children or college going young adults to become these participants in society as contributing members because why limit this to trauma informed uh, trauma transformed approaches to uh, highly stressed contexts every single yeah. workplace is highly stressed context every single interaction at home if you don't keep check <laughs> requires reframing <laughs> You know, yes. I mean, I think just yeah. why not learn about this? Um, so as we close, Dave, do you have any thoughts about how can we take these wonderful uh, nuggets of information and apply to universal way of uh, becoming these human beings who have very safe collective nations or 
Or is that too grandiose uh, a thought at this point? Yeah, you know, you know, I have friends and colleagues that are so good at thinking globally and then acting locally. Locally, I, I'm thinking, I have been amazed and humbled by the schools that I uh, work with in in Vermont and New York and 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 in parts of Canada that have been. And again, the word that you used before in describing yourself as being disruptive, that that you don't transform trauma if you're not disruptive. You, you don't yes. transform trauma by just following the status quo. Complacent, that, yeah. uh, our state has a, 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 a kind of a, a capacity and ability and many of the schools that I've worked with have a level of bravery and courage that just say, this sounds good. Let's test it with the workforce. If you can sell the workforce on this, then we will commit the resources. The, wow. The program that we offer is significantly less expensive than than packaged. You know, we we really try to tailor it. We're a small outfit. We're a small little mental health agency in 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 the, one of the smallest states in in the United States, and so we have trusted that what sells the program is relationships. Yeah. As what changes the work that we have to do with kids and families is relationships. So we use our own medicine, and that that the districts where this is really taking a footing is not the wealthiest districts. It's not the, yeah. you know, necessarily the most progressive. It's the ones that have allowed and enabled a relationship to develop between us and them and a level of trust and regard to figure let's, let's go through Cause I'm not, I'm not going to change it on my own. It's a partnership. It's a collaboration. It's a community. And that when we speak that language, there's often a lowering of any kind of defenses around, mm. um, what you're going to do or what you're going to change or where you're going to ask of us. Well, brilliant. I, I, I'm going to give you the list of quotes I have for you, the, what okay. you have said, which needs to be framed all over my office. So, and, and I wish to really uh, uh, educate myself even more deeply to understand how to uh, create communities because, you know, I, as a, a creator of a EXQ and a, a curriculum uh, in schools. I have a relationship with lots of districts and schools. And as we are expanding, I'm, I'm recognizing that uh, just schooling in 21st century post-COVID is not an easy process. Um, so Dave, I cannot thank you for your generous time and thank you listeners for your patience. Uh, we did take a little bit extra time uh, from you, but we meant to do that uh, because as you can see, Dave could have gone on for another two hours uh, in depth, um, but I really appreciate your time. So uh, that's all the time we have. Um, uh, thank you deeply, Dave, Dave Melnick, um, for being my guest. Um, as you can see, these are important conversations. And as you become knowledgeable and informed by our guests, um, we create communities where we share this common knowledge, which again becomes the, the uh, impetus to change. Uh, so uh, that's all the time we have. Um, as usual, if you love what you are listening to, share with your colleagues, friends, and family. Uh, please leave us a review. And we also will have um, this posted on YouTube in case uh, you would li like to see Dave and I uh, uh, bantering about this. So once again, thank you for joining in today. And uh, uh, let's um, see you again uh, next time here at uh, on Full Prefrontal. Thank you, Cheta. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.